Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal initially called my plan Bidenomics. I'm not sure they meant it in a totally complimentary way at the time. <laughs> but guess what? It's working. It's not working, Joe. Thanks to your Bidenomics, the U.S. national debt hit a new milestone exceeding $33 trillion. This is Congress dilly-dallies to avert another government shutdown at the end of the month. I mean, some economists are even predicting that the nation's debt is going to reach $50 trillion by 2030. And to no surprise, the administration continues to blame everyone and anyone but themselves, the people who actually control this. Now, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen saying that there's a disconnect... <laughs> to say the least, between the actual performance of the U.S. economy and how Americans feel about the president as handled it. Take a listen to this. There seems to be a disconnect between the numbers we're seeing and the way people are feeling about the economy, and how do you I, account for it? I, I agree with you that there's a disconnect, and um, I don't have a simple and convincing answer, but Americans have been through a lot. Gee, you think, lady? I, no convincing answer for us? I, I'll give you one. Your policies are terrible, and every one of your predictions has been wrong. Transitory inf inflation, you remember that one? Now, according to Treasury Department data, the federal government is once again not anywhere close to a balanced budget, meaning we're going to mortgage our children's future to pay for more useless junk. Last month, I asked the United States Congress for additional funds to expand World Bank financing by $25 billion. And the G20, we rallied the major economies of the world to mobilize even more funding. Oh, super. $25 billion for the World Bank. I can't think of a better. No. How the heck does this help somebody living in Kentucky who can't afford groceries or gas right now? You tell me why millions of Americans should give 100% of the taxes they pay to the government over to the World Bank. We're facing $33 trillion in debt. I would ask, is your life 33 trillion times better? Are your roads 33 trillion times more easy to drive on? Is your child's education 33 trillion times more effective? No, in fact, it's probably worse. The, it, it, it's very apparent to me, but the more money that government spends, the worse everything seems to get. There are very few people in this country that beg for more government, but nearly everyone begs for less regulation. So no more borrowing and no more spending on stupid stuff. Joining me now to discuss is someone I believe agrees with me, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul. Honored to have you on, Senator. Thanks for having me. You know, if the, if the goal of Bidenomics is bankruptcy, I'd say it's a wonderful success. You know, if they want to bankrupt the country and that's the goal, they're doing a great job. But uh, it is literally out of control. The last three months, we added a trillion dollars in debt in three months. So it literally is out of control. And really, both parties haven't woken up to the nightmare. I mean, really... Both parties have their head in the sand and are unwilling to look at entitlement spending, which is two-thirds of the spending, driving the debt. Military also has to be looked at, and so does the welfare. Everything has to be looked at if you want to try to balance your budget. Right. Well, Senator, you're one of the few who actually uses rationale and, like, actual economics to, to base your policies on, which we appreciate. The, the issue is, is none of them want to touch entitlement spending, like you just mentioned, because it's political suicide. But eventually, that stuff's all just going to evaporate, run out, or be drastically cut automatically because it'll be out of money. At what point do both parties realize, okay, guys, maybe we have to not spend, I don't know, $1.7 trillion on F-35s that crash? You know, I think they're mistaken. Most politicians are mistaken that you can't talk about entitlement reform. I've run three statewide elections, and I said from the very beginning that Medicare and Social Security were going bankrupt and that the only way to save them was actually to gradually raise the age at which we start them. We did it for Social Security back in the 80s. We raised the age from 65 to 67. And once the initial debate was done, there really wasn't a lot of public pushback. People just recognized it had to be done. I think it has to be done again. I think ultimately Social Security is going to have to go from 67 to 70. You do it a couple of months a year, and it takes about 10 or 15 years to actually get to 70, but it helps to balance the books. Right now, we uh, spend more on Social Security, more on Medicare than what comes in, and this chronic imbalance is really what drives the deficit. Yeah, that's shocking. Well, President Trump recently said that he would back a government shutdown if House conservatives aren't able to secure the appropriate deal to slash the spending. Listen to this. We have $35 trillion in debt. 
We have to save our country. So you would you know, shut down the government? You'd support that? I'd shut down the government if they can't make an appropriate deal, absolutely. The, the issue is, is that, yeah, okay, we shut down the government, a bunch of people who honestly live paycheck to paycheck like I did when I was an E5 in the military. They don't get a paycheck for three or four weeks. They miss a couple payments, but then they get back pay for essentially a vacation. Can we do something in the middle that's a little bit more rational to make this happen? You know, I think the goal should never be to shut the government down, but it's also irresponsible to keep it open, you know, and keep the status quo and keep spending $1.5 trillion more than comes in. What I've advocated for is, is that we continue to keep government open. We have a continuing resolution, but we basically just provide for the essentials, and that would be the military, Social Security, Medicare, and we have enough money for that. We just don't have enough money for most of the rest of government. Right. And so what we would do is downsize. About 70% of government we have money for. Let's decide the 70% that we actually have to have and keep that 70% open and start trimming everywhere else. If you did it to my druthers, though, I would actually put forward a plan I have for several years now to cut 5% of spending across the board. You do it over a five-year period and you balance your budget. You, everybody gets a little bit. And almost every business person I've ever talked to says that they could cut 5% out of their budget without cutting uh, workers or salaries or anything. They could really cut 5% just in waste. So I think it could be done, but somebody's got to get started. We just keep putting it off. And, you know, we've known for over a decade, Social Security and Medicare, we're running out of money. And now it's become a crisis. And yet still nobody wants to talk about it or do anything about it. We're still giving $12 million to gender study programs in Pakistan. So, Senator Rand Paul, you're a breath of fresh air, sir. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you.